Welcome to Houston Sports Talk with your host, Robert Land. Thanks for checking into the best Houston sports podcast. Robert along with Sports Radio 610's Sean Bajani, who's at NRG Stadium right after the Casario presser following Lovey Smith's ouster. Lots to talk about. It's a major Texans post-mortem. If you're new to the show, welcome to the party. You're in good hands. 45 years in journalism between the two of us, 35 covering Houston sports. And Sean, Casario basically said he'd be willing to step down as general manager if a coach they're bringing in doesn't feel like he should have the job. That was the headline takeaway for me. It is definitely the headline takeaway and the fact that he made mention of that about a handful of times. Um, you know, it's it, it's hard to have like immediate um, and adamant reaction after something like that because so much was said. I mean, I took a video of every question and answer um, that they had for him, and I think I had about 18 or 19 different clips. And so I'm going to have to go back through and parse through uh, some stuff that maybe I missed or we all missed, but I think absolutely that was the takeaway. And so just talking through this, Robert, if if that's the case, that he is in fact fearful uh, for his job or fearful that a potential head coaching candidate uh, might side-eye him as being maybe the common denominator and one of the reasons why um, this organization has continuously failed here in uh, the last couple of years, under his watch, then that's coming from somewhere else and probably not him. Okay. Because when this is when you get to a certain point and you get that first general manager job, or you get that first opportunity to put your stamp onto something and it's not going as planned, it's not going real well. How often in times in the professional industry is that person going to call themselves out and say, <laughs> you know, I'm just, I'm not really doing a great job. I'm going to have to take a step back. No, that to me sounded like, and maybe we should be very encouraged by this. To what degree? I think we're going to have to wait and see. But maybe we should be encouraged by the fact that that is the message, not coming from Nick Casario, but coming from the owner of this organization, or rather the chairman and CEO in Cal McNair, um, that that is his expectation, that this is an opportunity that if your reputation, if your past failures, if your past sins affect this organization in making the very best hire possible, then you're gone. Then I don't know how this out. plays out though, Sean, because this is the problem with that whole scenario. If he calls somebody in for an interview, he's probably going to ask them, you know, are you interested in working with me? And, and if they're not, he's not going to bring him in for an interview. That's number I, one. Number two, uh, if it's a group decision and the person comes in for an interview and he says he wants Casario gone, and that's the way this organization is going to work from here on out, then basically we're back to Bill O'Brien, the coach deciding who's going to be the general manager and running well, the football operations. I don't know that I don't know that you have to take it that far necessarily, but I, neither one of these scenarios are cut and dry, so to speak. It's not black or white. There is some gray area. And so let's just take it from, from your and mine standpoint. Let's just say you're a, a potential head coaching candidate and you contact uh, Robert Mc, or, sorry, uh, Cal McNair uh, after he's made a request. Let's just say you're Shane Steichen. And Steichen contacts the Texans and he's like, hey, you know, I'm really interested in this job. I'd like to meet and talk about it and there's a sit down between McNair and Casario, well, there's a fact-finding mission on both sides. They wanna figure out if this is gonna be a right fit for them, and they're gonna find out if it's gonna be a right fit for them in terms of the Houston Texans. It's a get to know you. And I think if you're Nick Casario, the worst thing that you could do, and if you're Cal McNair, the worst thing you could do is draw attention to your past failures. You do want transparency, but I also think that's a red flag for a candidate if in fact that candidate does not ask and initiate that conversation. I think that should be taken into totality in whether or not that is the right guy for you. I want a candidate that wants to know everything about me. A candidate, everything that I've been told when I go hunt for jobs, and I've been fortunate and blessed to not have to do that a whole bunch of times in my life, maybe just a couple to three times, but the number one thing when you go into an interview is you better know everything you possibly can about that company that you're interviewing for. 
And so let's not pretend that Ben Johnson, Shane Steichen, D'Amico Ryans, and you go on down that list, there's about 12, 15 names, and there might be 20 by the end of the day tomorrow. Every single one of those guys is going to know a brief history of what this organization has undergone the last three years. They're going to have just as many questions, if not more, as the Texans and Nick Casario would have to them. Here's uh, another issue that I had with not just this isn't just Casario. This is basically on the city of Houston as far as a media market. And this is also on just the way it was set up by the Texans communications department. They had one microphone set up. Cal McNair was available to speak. This is key. He never spoke because we had so much to talk about with Nick Casario. This is a huge thing. And I heard Casario. This is on the media, too. I heard him answer the same question over and over. It's a great question. The question was, you screwed up two coaching hires. Why are you still here? And I agreed with the question. Just wish there was some more variety in the questions, to be honest. And what it did was it wasted time so we didn't get to cross-examine Cal McNair on what was going on and ask him about what Casario said of the fact that he's sitting there saying, I'm going to step down if, if you don't want me here. And what does Cal McNair have to say about that? What does he have to say about the entire situation? This was totally botched, as usual, like they always do, by the Texans, but also botched by a Houston media that doesn't know what they're doing. They asked the same question 14,000 times. I don't know why. I got passed up uh, for a couple of questions by some individuals because there was only one microphone floating around. And I'm actually not that mad because at the end of the day, uh, you and I spoke about this before. What exactly were we going to get from Nick Casario uh, you know, to begin with? You know, we could ask a great question, but he is a master deflector, which I actually thought today he was a little bit off of his game. And I think the psychology, um, the study of his body language – um, I don't know if you watched it, Robert, or if you just listened to it. But no, thought, no, he looked nervous. Honestly, looked very nervous. You know, uh, I was just talking to Brandon Scott um, after this press conference, and I'd said, you know, you know that feeling that you have, you know, if you've gotten into a, a, a knockdown drag out with a, a, a buddy or a coworker or a spouse, or if you you find yourself in a situation where you know what you you nearly get in a car accident on your way to work and you kind of run in and you're flustered and you, that's that's the demeanor that he came into this press conference with and i've never seen him like that before granted over the course of the last 2 years you can maybe count on one hand how many times he's actually spoken in public to the media but the last time that i remember i mean i've been to every single one of these availabilities but the last one I remember very clearly was preseason, before the year started. He was as on his game as you possibly could be, you know, as, as robotic, as automatic as possible. He was in control. He was in command. He knew the agenda that was going to be covered, and he nailed it perfectly without saying anything. Today, I counted, you know, four or five times at least that he made mention of his job and what he would do if, in fact, um, a potential head coaching candidate or somebody uh, in a role pertinent to the success of this organization, if they weren't happy with them, then he would step down. And that's extremely odd. And so I think taking that into account um, is deserves a little bit more examination and to really thought in what's really going on here. Uh, getting back to your point about Cal McNair, that was never going to happen. That was he was never going to answer questions at the podium. And I I thought he was. Well, he said his, at the top of the yes, press conference, I'm going to answer questions and he didn't yes. do it. OK, but let me explain to you what happened, because you guys couldn't see it or you guys couldn't hear it. You know, press conference ends. You're done. What he meant by that was, is he's going to stay in the room post press conference and meander around and provide clarity to those individuals that wanted it off the record, so to speak which he absolutely did. There was a handful of media that hung around and were talking with uh, Cal McNair, um, uh, his assistant, which is, I can't know, I can't remember her name, but Hannah's sister. Um, and Grissom was also there as well. The team president, I believe is his official title. Um, and so he gave the impression that that was going to happen. Once the press conference Casario's portion concluded, we all stayed in our seats. Like as if Cal was going to take the podium, that never happened. 
he's walking out while Hannah's in a conversation with a reporter who has to point it in, you know, semi unprofessional question towards the end of that press conference, in my opinion. And he was watching her address him. And then bam, that was it. And so I stand up and I'm like, Hey, what's going on? Where's Cal? And, um, I was made, you know, I was put on notice that, well, yes, he will provide clarity, but it will not be behind a microphone. Yeah. It just, the whole thing, it's the typical Texans. They can't, they can't walk two feet with two feet, uh, in front of each other and, and not fall and trip and, you know, fall on their butt. It's just, it, it was pathetic as usual. Uh, Casario at least, you know, went up there and he, he did what, if he didn't do it, it would have been a big mistake. He basically, you know, put his, put himself under the bus and said, it's, it's on me. You know, the old, it's on me deal. We seen with going back to the Tracy McGrady years and the Rockets and stuff like that. But man, I also want to ask you because, you know, we, we, we haven't even talked about the exit interviews yet. yet. One player said something that caught my ear, but just a quick, before we get there, make sure to subscribe and comment on YouTube. That's how you can support us. You can listen to every new show on your favorite podcast app. And Sean, Damian Pierce said he was healthy enough to play at the end of the season, but the organization decided against it. I guess they were tanking a little bit after all, weren't they? <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. Can you can you repeat that last part one more time, Robert? Well, Damian Pierce said he was healthy enough to play at the end oh, of the season, yeah. but the organization decided against it. I, I'm saying I guess they, they were tanking after all. Yeah, and you know I was right there front and center, and I, I also thought he made mention that he would have played if, in fact, there was a game this week, but there's not. That That's kind of how he qualified that. So, um, you know, they're protecting, you know, a franchise running back in that instance, and I thought that if they were going to do that, why didn't you do the same thing with the guy that you're um, going to consider giving a massive extension to in Laramie Tunsil? Uh, another guy that you're going to consider giving another extension extension to in the right tackle, Titus Howard, who enters the uh, fifth and final year of uh, his rookie contract, an option they picked up this past uh, May, I believe. Um, you could have done that with a number of players. Those two particularly, Brandon Cooks might have been another one. Jalen Petrie, who suffered a concussion in the game, is somebody that you might have given serious consideration to, though we do know how you know, weak and shallow that depth chart is in terms of what they have at their disposal at the safety position. But um, they certainly could have made some business decisions. And in my opinion, this is or that was yesterday's uh, game and how it played out. Never mind the result, but just the sheer fact that all of those guys were uh, on the field for the amount of time that they were. Um, is another failure by by Nick Casario. And you, you know, didn't tank hard enough is what it comes down to. And players aren't going to do it. You, you players yeah. don't want to do it. They're not going to do it. They're on the field for a multitude of reasons. Maybe the top three are to try and stay on the field for the following season, make money and win. Oh and, yeah. Yeah. No, this is, it's did. about an organization, a tanking it. When you, whenever you say the word tanking in sports, it's, organization, it's an yeah. organizational thing. If you're too dumb to know that, then please don't watch uh, our podcast because we got smart people watching our podcast. And I, you know, I'm like, you got to know that. You have to understand. Everybody knows yeah. players are out there. They're playing as hard as they can. Yeah, but, but a lot but, of people don't. A lot of people don't. You do, you know, you read the comments on all of social and stuff like that. There's just people that flat out don't understand that. And um, it's it's just kind of mind numbing and it's ridiculous. And I know that's the minority instead of the majority. At least I'd like to think so. Um, but I tell you what, man, this this is going to be a very interesting follow, you know, in the coming days and weeks. Um, what I also thought maybe, you know, was another bullet point to take away from this press conference today was in the Conserio portion. Um, I mean, Cal was limited. He only spoke for, you know, two minutes and change, and that was it. But Conserio was asked a good question by Mark Berman, you know, what the firing of Lovey Smith means for the rest of the staff. And it, it appears is that's going to be made in conjunction with how Casario grades the staff here in the coming days, whom he already met with, um, and what that head, new head coach thinks of the current staff and their assessments and the value that he would place on guys um, at, at, at those at, as those position coaches and coordinators. So it's going to be interesting. Um, I, I wanted to do the homework before, but I just didn't have an opportun uh, opportunity to do so. How often, maybe you know this off the top of your head, Robert, but how often, you know, is a coach fired and the staff retained 
versus the entire staff being fired in certain situations. Yeah, it's always a piece of staffs that stick around. And even when I'm looking through these guys that are coaching candidates, I'm going to get to that in just one second because, you know, we found out who the Texans have reached out to interview. But, you know, Sean, you see that all the time where there's some guys that stay and some guys that don't. The GM will recommend, I like this guy. Let's keep this guy. Unless you've got somebody better in mind, I'm assuming that's how the conversation mm -hmm. probably goes. And then what happens typically is the coach says, yeah, I definitely want to bring this guy in. I definitely want to bring that guy in maybe. And then there's probably a back and forth and you would hope that they work with each other because that's how the relationship's got to be moving forward. Yeah. And so I, I'm going to be interested, you know, think of the guys that you believe are deserving to stay on the next staff. Um, you know, one guy that comes to my mind particularly is obviously Frank Ross, you know, their special teams coordinator, who's still very young and I don't think they would entertain um, or maybe if he would even be interested at, at least the NFL level, because he's so young and still has so much more, I think, to learn, even though uh, he has the chops to be a head coach, uh, maybe not just in this league, but certainly at the collegiate level, if he chooses to do so. I don't think they entertain him as a head coaching candidate. They're not in the business of being able to do favors right now, um, not in the position of it anyway, like they did last year and really the last couple of years with some unqualified candidates. Um, but he would definitely be one that I'd want to retain. George Warhop, their offensive line coach, uh, who I think did a really good job this year, and Titus Howard, Laramie Tunsil, Kenyon Green, uh, Scott Questenberry, uh, Scott Questenberry um, all spoke very highly of him. Those were just particular guys on the line that I spoke to uh, throughout the course of the season. I heard some good things about Ben McDaniels, but you got to be careful with that. He was the passing game coordinator and a receiver coach for the Texans, and if we're being honest with ourselves, if we're going to pick holes and it was very easy to do so with this offense and its lack of creativity and innovation and success, uh, regardless of who was on or off the field at a given time, I'm not so sure that, uh, you know, he would stick around. I, I, I don't know uh, about the defensive side of the ball with as bad as they were against the run. Um, maybe you consider Dino Vasso and uh, Joe Dana, you know, their secondary coaches at corner and safety which, you know, did have a really good element on that defense this year. Um, and you saw a lot of good things uh, with their young guys. So, it, you know, maybe you retain, you know, a handful of them. But it's going to be interesting because you do know whoever comes in, if it's a Steichen, if it's a Johnson, if it's a Gannon, uh, if it's a D'Amico Ryans, they've got their handful of guys on their particular sides of the ball, but also some the other side of the ball, if it's offense, defense, defense, offense, that they're going to bring along uh, just for sheer – uh, comfortability uh, and because they believe in their vision and their plan. Last thing we got to hit is who the Texans are bringing in supposedly, according to Aaron Wilson, who we trust and the Texans, they've requested interviews from five coaching candidates, Eagles offensive coordinator, Shane Steichen, Eagles, DC, Jonathan Gannon, 49ers, DC, D'Amico Ryan. So he's in play after all Broncos, DC, Ijiro Avero. I'll help I'm pronouncing that correctly. And Lions, OC, Ben Johnson for the five coaches that we brought up were, you know, in yesterday's live post game show, we're on that list. So that's interesting. Gannon interviewed with the Texans last year. Ben Johnson oversaw that great Lions offense with Jared Goff, like we said yesterday. But Johnson's work with different styles of offense with guys like Chip Kelly, Mike Sherman, Adam Gase, Gannon's defensive influences, Mike Zimmer, Steve Spagnola, Colts DC, Matt Eberflus, Steichen just developed. Jalen Hurts, Avero worked with Vic Fangio and the Broncos, uh, former Texans coach. He also worked with defensive assistant with the Rams, uh, Wade Phillips, former defensive coordinator as well under the Texans. He worked with Brandon Staley and Raheem Morris. And what's interesting, uh, Sean, about this list is that several of these guys, not the Miko Ryans, but I, I'm looking at through this list and about uh, two or three of these guys, a couple of them, are uh, available right now. You know, Ben's, Ben Johnson, you could hire him tomorrow. Uh, Lions are done. Uh, Ijiro Avero, you could hire tomorrow. But if these other guys, if they get interviews with these guys, you're going to have to wait a, a little bit. And especially with these Eagles uh, coordinators, you're going to have to wait a long time potentially because uh, yeah. they could be in the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, potentially. And, uh, you know, Cal McNair did break that down. Um, in, in the meantime, he can interview these guys via Zoom. Um, and I think it's uh, next week, 
um, or, or maybe a short time after that uh, where he can actually, um, you know, start talking to guys uh, in person and, and, and doing conducting more formal interviews. Um, so those particular guys that you'd said would, would be available like right now today since their seasons are over, that's going to be an interesting follow. And I think that's I think it's imperative that the Texans jump on this as soon as they possibly can. Not that there's a, a rush really to hire a guy, but it's a rush to do your due diligence on every single individual. And, you know, you, you could say what you want to. I don't really care if this list goes 20 deep. Give me a top 10 list. Give me your top 10 candidates and let's make it a point to hit every single one of those guys as soon as we possibly can. Digest everything um, that we possibly can and make the most informed um, and responsible decision as we enter into the most pivotal you know, franchise in our history. 21 years going into season 22 um, this year with the April draft upcoming. So it's going to be huge. And, you know, there's one other point that I guess I wanted to make in regards to this coaching search and, and what they, what they I, I guess, what the due diligence should be. One guy comes to mind, and that's Gannon. And I do feel like if you pay attention to the reports, that's somebody you've probably heard a little bit more about than the others. And particularly, maybe it's because he interviewed with them last year. That's going to be interesting to keep an eye on him. Um, and, and there's connections alone. with the two with him and Casario as well, but, because Casario and him know each other through their mutual friend. I think Josh McDaniels is what I read. And that's going to be the interesting thing. What did Nick Casario say five times tonight? At least I have to go back. I can't wait till we get the transcripts for this and how many times he mentioned his job security in so many words. But OK, who's he got a familiarity with? Well, that's Gannon, who interviewed with him last year. Gannon. Um, if, you know, maybe in a perfect universe, they do match up and he is the best candidate and he's also got a good working relationship potentially with Nick Casario, that'd be a beautiful thing for Nick. Would it be the best thing for the organization? I don't know. Um, also I, real key, what Aaron Wilson brought up, you know, who he could bring in on his staff, which is, th that's always huge when you bring in a head coaching candidate yeah. and Gannon, uh, might bring in Frank Reich. He has a relationship with Frank Reich from their days with the Colts. Uh, he he obviously has the relationship with Mike Zimmer, um, having worked with him as a defensive coordinator. Uh, of course, uh, by the way, you're hearing a lot of noise. As, a, as I said, Sean is out at the stadium and he's in the lobby. So that's all the noise you're hearing right now. But uh, there, there's a there's a ready-made staff of people that Gannon knows that you could bring in a very respected staff. And obviously, you know, Frank Reich, you know, he got fired, but he's known as an offensive guy. And, and that's what his calling card was to begin with. So um, those, those are some pretty good, you know, coaching uh, tree people that he can bring in to start a, a Texan staff. And that's maybe the most important thing to look at when you're searching for a candidate, at least, you know, from, from our perspective, because there are other things that, you know, we just can't know. Um, that uh, are privy to a general manager and an owner and whoever is on the search committee internally for them um, to make these decisions. Um, but one, I, I one think, of the things I was going to ask you, by the way, speaking of what yeah. you just said, was that Casario mentioned in the press conference, I didn't use the resources in the building that I should have used when I was looking to, and I, I think he specifically mentioned when he was looking to hire coaches, do you have any idea what he was talking about? Maybe there's people that he didn't use that he thought he could have used in that hiring. Do you have an idea? I, I, I don't. And that was actually one of the questions that I wanted to ask. And, you know, I, I know I got confused. Somebody was texting me earlier, like, hey, who was that guy that asked that question towards the end? Well, I had my hand raised and I was told there's not enough time you know, they're going to give the mic to this guy and a regrettable decision that was. And I made a, sh a point to uh, point that out. Like, come on, man, can't let that happen again. But I, no, I wanted to ask um, a, a question uh, in that regard. But I also wanted to ask a follow up, you know, for, for Nick Casario, too, in, in why uh, it's so important for the owner you know, or chairman and CEO, you know, is the proper title for Cal McNair to be involved in the hiring process in this regard. And maybe that's what he'd meant. You know, maybe he would have killed two birds with one stone and I would have done the same with that question. But, you know, Cal McNair, if you recall, um, you know, they hired a search firm, uh, Corn Ferry, 
you know, to 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 find them candidates. And it was almost as if like, you know, hey, this could be viewed as a pretty good sign that he's allowing football people to do their jobs. But at the same time, he's not taking their football people's opinions seriously enough because they were also looking for outside you know, counsel um, to help in their search. And they made a decision, you know, on Lovey Smith, who was not even broached, you know, in that regard. Cully was not broached by the Corn Ferry Tour, recommended by them. Um, and, and we've kind of been there, done that. But I think, you know, he quite possibly could be talking about uh, Cal McNair. And I think that that's a street that goes two ways, because I think Cal McNair's maybe recognized the fact that, you know, in his role as chairman and CEO, he's got to take a much act, more active one in this search um, if it's going to be turned around. And let's not let's be honest here, too. Cal's under a lot of pressure with the family situation as well. And I can't speak too much on that uh, because I only know a little bit, but I know enough to understand that he's feeling the pressure, not just from the city, the fans um, and internally, but also from, you know, the family side of things, which his relationship on his side particularly is strained. So it's it's a very tumultuous and interesting time for him uh, as the Texans, you know, kind of plug forward and make some uh, pivotal decisions here in the coming uh, weeks and months. I know it's been a long day for you. Is there anything that we missed, uh, didn't mention in the press conference, anything in the players exit interviews, something that uh, caught your fancy, do you think final word from you? Man, you know, there's a lot. Uh, I really haven't had a, a ton of time to sit down and parse through stuff. Um, you know, I, I was in the locker room, as you mentioned, uh, all morning. Uh, talked to a lot of the pertinent players, but I was even a little bit more taken back to the guys that we didn't get a chance to talk to. Um, which is why, you know, I, before this last game, I, I kind of made it a point to, you know, speak to as many people as I possibly could. I treated that pregame opportunity as almost an exit interview process to speak to guys like Jerry Hughes and Jalen Petrie, who obviously he was available today, like visible in the locker room, but he's on concussion protocol, so he couldn't talk. Um, you know, I would have liked to have spoken to uh, Stephen Nelson, um, Nico Collins, um, you know, just a, a number of guys. And, you know, we did get a chance to talk to uh, Brandon Cooks and Davis Mills and uh, 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 Titus Howard um, and Damian Pierce, if I didn't mention him already. So there was a handful of guys, and they're all up on my Twitter. But I, I, as far as anything that they'd said, you know, just in general, and maybe you wouldn't anticipate anything otherwise, but they all had really great things to say. And great's not a stretch. In fact, glowing is probably the more appropriate term, especially speaking particularly of Damian Pierce in regards to Lovey Smith and what he'd meant to the development of his career and his start. But it almost seemed a little bit more from a, a bitter standpoint from Damian in that he looked at it like, hey, I'm a rookie this year, and I had this new coach who was great, and I relied on him so much. And now guess what? I'm going to have to be a rookie again next year because I had a handful of games taken away from me and I'm going to have a new coach. I'm going to have a whole new system to learn and it's all going to be new to me. And so he was almost in that moment preparing his mind for what is to come. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I also thought Brandon Cooks and his comments in regards to maybe this being the last time he's cleaning out his locker as a member of the Houston Texans, it seemed as if he was really ready to go when he uses the language like my representation, you know, I trust them to, you know, put me in the best situation. And I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but yeah, yeah. He sounds as good as gone from everything that he said since the game he does. But yeah. you know what, if you think Nick Casario looks, you know, bad yesterday, worse today, it's not over for him because whatever decision is made in regard to Brandon cooks, whatever finality there is, at least for this 2023 season, if he's back and there's amends made, it's not a good look for Nick Casario because you're paying a guy $18 million this year with a massive cap hit as a number one receiver who's a glorified number two maybe at best right now, at least on this team. Um, and then two, if you do deal him, how much money are you going to have to eat? What are you going to be able to get in return later on this spring or into the summer? for Brandon Cooks when you potentially could have had a two already and eaten some of that money this year. So he's going to end up looking bad once again. Um, and it's just going to be interesting to see how maybe he can usurp that with, um, 
who he takes at number two, if the Texans stay at number two, what kind of draft haul they come away with with 11 total picks so far. At least that's what they'll enter into the draft with as it stands right now. So there's a lot of moving parts here, and it's going to be an interesting follow. But I guess those are the main things that I was able to take away from today. And I I just wish that you know we would have had a chance to hear from Cal. I think fans deserve it. I don't think it's good enough that, you know, he had a basic ask me anything on Reddit four months ago. That was not the proper forum to get real questions answered, to get real answers. It's a whole lot different when you can look a guy in the eye and you have a camera and a microphone there and you're held accountable in that regard. And I just thought fans deserved it, um, if, especially if he's going to take a much more active role. Um, the next opportunity that we'll have to speak to Cal McNair presumably will be upon the hire of a new head coach. He should be introducing him along with Nick Casario and be made available then. And I just hope that the Texans really seize that opportunity and he comes prepared as he ever has been since being in this role as the active owner and chairman and CEO of this organization and answer the really tough questions because you know what you're going to get from Nick. And it's not like they're dumb. They're smart for playing it the way that they did. But people need to see it. People need to hear it. And so I, I just think the fans deserve it. And hopefully the Texans seize that opportunity here in the coming weeks and months. This press conference, this whole thing speaks exactly to what everybody hates about this organization. They are cowardice. They have an owner who is cowardice, who's afraid to get in front of the microphone and just be honest with the fans and say what's going on and ask answer questions like, like that need to be answered. They've got a general manager that seems to be a robot and, and not say anything. And Texans fans that, you know, just want somebody that they can relate to a little bit. You know, this is Houston, Texas. The, the, the people in Houston, Texas are about, you know, they, they care. They care. They, they yeah. want to know who you are. This is about who you are. This is a city that's produced Bum Phillips and Guy V. Lewis and <clears throat> Phil Garner and Larry Durker and Dusty Baker. And I mean, we could go on and on of the Rudy Tomjanovich, the great coaches that came out of here because they related to everybody in Houston. And the, the fact that you have two guys that just don't seem to want to relate to Houstonians and they don't want to talk to us and be honest and get in front of us and say that. And, and, and Nick was honest to a degree. But again, he spent 30 minutes mostly filibustering and not saying much of anything. Yeah. And, 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 and that's that's his M.O. at this point as a general manager. I, um, you know, you make a, you make a really good point, but you name a lot of coaches, you know, what about the owners? I mean, go back to uh, Les Alexander with the Rockets, um, who was never, you know, really shy about, uh, you know, saying what needed to be said in front of a camera, you know, that was never really his shtick, but he understood that when he needed to make a point, he was going to, you know, uh, pull no punches. He was going to say what he needed to spend. And he said some regrettable things over the years, but he dealt with it, you know, um, he wasn't afraid, and I, I'm not going to sit here and call the Texans, you know, cowardice. I, I don't know if I'm ready for that. I'll, I just kind of look at it this way: like they understand what they have, and Cal is not um, game for that role in front of a camera and prepared um, to address a lot of those things. And so, and I, and I think in, if in that's the point, if that's what, if that's who he is then I think he should step down as maybe CEO and chairman, if that's possible, and hand that to somebody else and say, I'm the owner, and, and have that person answering the questions and sort of being the front man for the organization. I don't know if that helps his case out a lot, but at least it gives somebody else to answer questions to about what's going on with the general manager. And ultimately, you know, what he alluded to in his opening statement this evening was transparency and clarity. And if he's going to provide that, then he needs to do it to the people that matter most, which are the fans, the consumers of the product, the ones that are asking those questions um, in the media. You know, like it was not a proper forum for the media to stick around and stand in line and ask him, you know, every question that we had. It just wasn't that way. It turned into a, a reception of sorts. And if you could get with them, you could get with them and ask them a question or two. And that was it. And I'm not here for that. Um, I'm here to ask the questions, you know, for the fans. I'm here to ask my own personal questions because I am a fan as well. Um, and I, I, I want the response to be heard by all. I want the question to be heard by all and open completely for any type of criticism necessary. 
And that's just not a forum that he's comfortable with. That's not a forum that the Texans are comfortable with him having. And maybe rightfully so, because they're at a point in time now, Robert, where optics, it's been very bad. And you could say, well, yeah, you know what? It can't get much worse. Well, it could, I guess, always. But now's not the time for that. You have to try to put the people in front of the camera, in front of the microphone that are going to be charged with making decisions. And those that are going to be held accountable, and Nick told you as much about five times tonight, he's going to be that guy. He's also the right guy to answer those questions. While he doesn't say anything, he sure sounds good, sounds professional doing it. Um, but I, I was just... I was taken back tonight by the nervousness on both Cal McNair and Nick Casario that they displayed. I was, I just didn't know, like you, you wonder what happened in the concourse upon the entrance into the auditorium and you wonder what this day was like for them, the conversations that were had, the ultimatums that were maybe made. Um, I think it's going to be a really interesting follow. It's just a thought. You tell me what you think. Well, the one well, thing on, about hold on, hold on. Oh, okay. I, I was going to ask you a question. You, you tell me what you think. Is it at all out of the realm of possibility in this regard? Not that a potential head coaching candidate might not necessarily jive with Nick, and Nick feels that and says, "All right, well, if this is the best candidate, but I'm not the best fit to have this guy here, then I'll step down." What if, because Nick is here, he can't find the best candidate? Nobody wants to come and work here. You know, is that the same thing? You know, is that a possibility? And is that time that the Texans have to waste on even, you know, coming to that sort of conclusion in a couple of three, four weeks? Yeah, that whole statement that he made, there's just a lot of holes that you can blow into that whole thing. And I, I don't think it works out good at all for the Texans. As usual, you feel like, they're on the fence on everything. They're on the fence on Casario. They're on the fence whether they wanted to even hire Levy Smith. They were on the fence about, you know, what to do with Deshaun Watson before finally the massage stuff started to happen. This is an organization that can't, it's like the it's got commitment issues, is basically what I'm yeah. saying. <laughs> like, <laughs> hey, give me the ring or get off the, you know, and, and Cal McNair, I don't think he is committed to being an owner. And and that's the that's kind of one of the problems is like, look. If you want to be the owner of a football team, you've got to be willing to get out there and be public about what's going on and to be honest about what's going on. And if you're afraid to do it, then you probably shouldn't be an owner of a football team. And, and I get it. You can do whatever you want to, but this is somebody that he knows it was gifted to him. And if this is not fun for you, being an owner and all that goes with it, then sell the team. You, you make uh, you know billions and billions of dollars for selling an NFL team. It wasn't something that was his idea to begin with. It was his dad's idea. He might have thought it was, oh, that's kind of fun. Let's go. go. But he doesn't know anything about being a football team. The only thing that I will give Cal McNair and, and, and his reason for being nervous in public is what happened to his, his dad, Bob's reputation at the end with what happened, you know, about what he said about the players. And, you know, we were right in the middle of the Me Too movement and, you know, Black Lives Matter and all that stuff. And, and his reputation was a little bit sullied, you know, I thought sort of unfairly with what he said publicly, but that's what happens. And what he said publicly wasn't the smartest thing to say or how he worded it wasn't the smartest thing to say. But I think because he saw what happened to his dad, I think he's a little bit gun shy in getting in front of a microphone. Well, he had his own issue too. Was it two years ago or a year and change ago? You know, at some function where he made some uh, sideways remark about, uh, you know, the, the COVID-19 epidemic and called it, you know, the China virus, um, you know, publicly. And he had to apologize for that, you know, while, you know, him and Hannah, you know, were kind of <laughs> laughing and chuckling to themselves like they just made a funny. But everybody else around him was just like, what? That's kind of inappropriate, you know, like read the crowd kind of thing. I mean, you might be right, but he's already kind of been there, done that. I mean, this is his circle. This is his aura. This is this is his job. This is the business. This isn't just some, you know, off the cuff remark, you know, that you say to the wrong crowd at the wrong time. I mean, yes, look, he's got to talk to an entire city, an entire fan base and address um, his football team, you know, after, you know, following his his late father around for you know 20 years 
and, and learning the ropes from him that knowing one day this is going to be my responsibility, this is going to be my baby, you'd think that that sort of side of things would have come a little bit more naturally, you know, watching his, his father kind of handle those sorts of things. And it just hasn't. And you're comfortable with what you're comfortable with to a certain degree, Robert. But if you're going to take upon the responsibility, you have to kind of, you know, like, and I don't necessarily believe in this, you know, as a personal philosophy, but I know a lot of people do and fake it till you make it. You know what I mean? And I, I don't really see a concerted effort by him to doing just that. Um, it's not hard to talk about something that you should be passionate about. And if you're not passionate about, um, you know, taking something and building something, carrying on a legacy that, yes, you know what, it might have been tarnished, maybe is too strong of a word, but you're right. I mean, what Bob McNair did say, what was made public, I mean, that was still on the, on the fresh on the minds of a lot of people uh, right around the time that he passed away. And I remember doing a show and finding out about it live on air. And that was like the first thing that I thought of. And I, I said, like, how do I want to frame this and break the news and kind of do a quick eulogy of sorts, you know, for, for Bob and talk about all those things and dance around this because now is not the time nor place to bring something like that up in a guy's passing. But it was that fresh on my mind. And I know it must have been on a lot of other people, but you have to arrive at a point in time where you can step back and understand what's in front of you, what you're charged with, the responsibilities, and keep it to just that. And you can't be afraid. And, you know, I, I just hope that, you know, he kind of learns a little bit more through this process and how active he says he's going to be through this process and just starts to pick up on some things that he can then generate and, um, I guess, convey to, to the media, to the city, to the fan base in the future. Well, let's do this again in a couple of days. I think we're going to have some more things to talk about in the not too distant future. Yeah. Um, I'm going to talk Rockets with Frank tomorrow. So if you're a Rockets fan, you're going to want to listen to that. Uh, thanks for doing this, Sean. Thanks for staying late at, yeah. the, at, at NRG for this. Yeah, you know, appreciate you having me, man. I know we're kind of talking through a lot of things, but I think we're at the point in time with this organization really where, uh, you know, hot takes, you can kind of toss those out. We, we're at that point. We just need to kind of talk through things and, <laughs> and think a little bit on them. So that's what I'm going to go do. Oh, I hope this gets better, but I don't think it will. It will. I, it will. Uh, all right. Well, we'll, we'll catch you later, man. And uh, if you, people out there, make sure if you aren't already subscribe to us. So you make sure you get every single one of our shows when it, when it happens, you get a notification and, and uh, cause you're going to want to hear, we're going to, we're going to have some interesting guests over the next few months on the Texans draft and other things. So stay tuned. You're listening to Houston Sports Talk. Hey, you can support the show by subscribing on YouTube and commenting on the videos. Listen to Houston Sports Talk on Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, and Google. Don't forget to tell a friend and share our show on social media. Spread the word, everybody. Thanks for listening.